Good afternoon, folks, and uh, welcome to our next panel uh, entitled Wither NATO, uh, the Cold War Redux, question mark. Um, I'm Guy Swan. I'm the Vice President at the Association of the United States Army and a proud member of the Aspen Institute Homeland Security Group. In the fall of 1989, I was a uh, junior officer uh, serving with the U.S. Army in southern Germany, uh, not far away from my friend then Major Doug Lute uh, in, in uh, Nuremberg. And like many of you, we watched the wall come down and were stunned by the seemingly endless stream of East German Trabants making their way down Audubon 9. After the shock, euphoria, and novelty of the moment began to fade, many of us serving in the U.S. military in Europe and in NATO collectively asked ourselves, what now? The Warsaw Pact was an unraveling before our eyes, and the purpose and future of the NATO alliance in place since 1949 was becoming less clear. A year later, much of the U.S. military and several NATO allies found themselves engaged in the first Gulf War. Large military formations designed to face down the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact partners were moved out of Europe to another theater of operations for the first time in 40 years. Most of those forces never returned to Europe after the Gulf War and the subsequent breakup of the Soviet Union. And many of the Western allies drew down their forces and turned their, their attention to what has become a 25-year engagement in the Middle East. Other than the Balkans episode in the mid to late 1990s, much of NATO's attention has been out of area for a long, long time. Fast forward to today, and certainly much has changed. At last year's forum, you may recall Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General Martin Dempsey, addressed Russia's annexation of Korea, uh, Crimea, and since then, conflict in eastern Ukraine appears to once again bring the NATO alliance in con confrontation with Russia. In response to Russian, Russian actions, NATO has ramped up its training exercises and pre-positioning of equipment, ostensibly to reassure its easternmost allies. All of this has generated a reassessment of the transatlantic alliance and its relationship vis-a-vis -vis Russia, even as the alliance continues its multinational mission in Afghanistan. To discuss the state of the alliance, Russia, and what the future may hold, we have a terrific panel this afternoon, all of whom are engaged daily in issues involving the security of this vital part of the world. To guide the discussion, we are pleased to have Eli Lake, Mr. Lake's distinguished career in national security reporting has taken him from the New York Sun and the UPI to uh, Newsweek, The Daily Beast, The New Republic, and now to Bloomberg View. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to Eli. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much. And we have a, a terrific panel here. So I guess I should introduce everybody. We have Ambassador Wittig from Germany, uh, the German ambassador to the, uh, Washington, uh, Dr. Ellen Farkas from the Pentagon, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense dealing with uh, Ukraine, Russia, and other issues in Europe. Of course, Ambassador Kislyev, uh, Russia's ambassador uh, to Washington, and Ambassador Doug Lute, who is the US ambassador to NATO. So let me start off with a question for everyone. We can go in order. Uh, as the title of this suggests, is there a new Cold War between the West and Russia? Well, let me first of all thank you uh, for having me. Uh, it's a great privilege uh, for me to be here for the first time at that uh, distinguished forum. Yes, the Cold War is over. Um, the Cold War was a sustained um, high-risk situation that brought us uh, very close to a military conflagration and maybe annihilation. And this is not the situation we have now. We don't want the Cold War back. But what we have is probably the most serious and most dangerous challenge of the European security order since the fall of the war. Um, Russia has damaged our European uh, security architecture uh, in an unprecedented way through a land grab, wanting to redraw the maps, violating uh, the territorial integrity of a neighboring uh, country, and the loss of trust uh, was deep 
and, 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 and very significant. And the loss of confidence is difficult to restore and it will take a long, long time. But having said that, um, and this might be an interesting message here for the American audience, uh, we believe that in Europe, um, security and stability in the, wrong run, in the long run, we will not have without or against Russia. Now, while we focus now on Eastern Ukraine to diffuse and contain and hopefully help to solve that crisis and help to stabilize the whole of Ukraine and reassure our Eastern allies in NATO, the longer term challenge will be to reintegrate Russia into the common European security architecture. So I think we have to uh, choose a very comprehensive approach. Uh, we have to enhance um, our collective defense in NATO, but in the long run, uh, we have to search for a new cooperative security agenda with Russia. So this is a two-track approach, if you will. In former times, this was called deterrence and uh, detente, and maybe this time we want to have a new uh, uh, wording for this, or we could say, uh, you know, deterrence, resilience, and engagement. But this is, I think, uh, the challenge that uh, we are facing for the future. Um, well, thank you very much, Eli. Thank you to the Aspen leadership for another excellent Aspen event. I'm very happy to be back again. Thank you to Clark Irvin for inviting me. I think everything changed with the attempted illegal annexation of Crimea about 17 months ago, and then with the ongoing intervention in eastern Ukraine. Russia's actions clearly demonstrated that they have a foreign policy that's revanchist, revisionist, that flies in the face of international law. And so what we've been doing ever since then, really, as a, as a, as a united front, transatlantic front, has been to work with Russia and with the Ukrainians to try to bring Russia back into agreement with international law and to try to resolve the situation in Ukraine. But let's face it, there are Russian troops occupying Georgia today. There are Russian troops in Ukraine, in Crimea, and then in the east. So we have a difficult situation that we have to resolve with the Russians. I do agree with the ambassador, though, of course, in the long run, stability in Europe depends on a responsible international stakeholder residing in Moscow. Ambassador. I don't believe that we are back in the Cold War because the basic premises of the Cold War are no longer. Because in the Cold War we had the ideological divide that was translating in a frontal confrontation between the Warsaw Pact and NATO. We certainly are not seeking a return to the Cold War. And it's not us who are pulling the whole relations between the West, NATO, and Russia into a difficult situation that you are pushing it. The problem for us from the, what uh, NATO countries are doing, including the United States, of course, is that in a situation where there was an anti-constitutional overthrow of the government, forceful overthrow of the government, that was done on the shoulders, as we say, of the extreme nationalist and pro-fascist organizations, United States and later the rest of NATO chose to support it. When some people who feel Russian, who speak Russian in Ukraine, couldn't agree with what was stolen from them in Kiev, and when that kind of overthrow results were forced on them, they didn't agree. They didn't agree in the East because the president that was toppled came from this particular region. He was he, their candidate. In Crimea, there are even more Russian, not only speakers, but ethnic Russians, traditionally living in the area. They all were threatened. And hadn't they decided, and I underline the word, they decided to go independent for what they have all the legal rights under international law, and afterwards deciding to join Russia, the situation in uh, Eastern Ukraine would be happening there, but to significantly larger extent. But having decided what they did, they live now comfortable, 
a proud life as citizens of Russia. So what is happening now, instead of talking with us, talking with the Ukrainians in order to deal with the issue, and to deal with the issue is this, to make the Ukrainian government to talk to their own people rather than bomb them into submission of something they are not willing to accept. And instead of talking to them, they are shelling them. They are organizing the dividing lines and call them separatists and terrorists. Separatists and terrorists. Separatists, those who presented the draft amendment to the Constitution to involve them in Ukraine as autonomous part. Terrorists who defend their lives and their families, their houses from the extreme nationalists that were singing in the streets. If you find a Moscow, Moscow is derogative Russian in Ukrainian, put him on a knife. And you want them to accept that easily. They wouldn't do that. And we are extremely disappointed that US data, instead of focusing on what needs to be done in order to bring together normal civilized relations within Ukrainian uh, country, you are supporting those who started the war against their own people. Just remember, the first draft law that was adopted in the Rada after these events was to ban the use of Russian language. It never entered into force, though, but it was approved of. The last interesting draft proposal that is on the table of the Rada is to ban, to name Russia, Russia. And this ban needs to be punishable under the law. What is happening there is very disappointing to us because Russia and the United States are, and uh, in Ukraine are so intertwined, historically, uh, family-wise, economically. And we certainly are very much disappointed that instead of working with us from day one in order to make peace there, you chose to exert pressure on Russia economically and also in demonstration NATO might next to our borders. The sorties of NATO aircraft has doubled, I think, uh, you know, in one year, up to 750 next to our borders a year. The sorties of the air, uh, <coughs> AWACS type of aircraft increased by nine times. The naval ships of NATO are almost now present next to our borders in Black Sea. And recently, uh, American forces organized a parade at 300 meters from Russian uh, border at 150 kilometers from St. Petersburg. The B-52 were used for recent uh, exercises next to Russia, B-52s. I understand they didn't carry nuclear weapons, but it was message, and we can read messages. So it's deplorable where we are. And the whole history of NATO-Russian relations after the end of the Cold War is a history of lost opportunities. I happened to be the first Russian ambassador who came to work at NATO after the signature of the Founding Act. And I see now that what is left of the Founding Act is on the, another uh, dangerous threat with the United States deciding to deploy heavy weapons, pre-deploy, in the regions where they promised us not to have permanent deployment. And the permanent deployment have been replaced by permanent presence uh, on the rotational basis of American and NATO forces next to our borders. And permanent rotation is even worse than the pre-deployment because you train your soldiers to fight there. The character of the exercises that have been always conducted in this region by NATO with partners has also changed. Two to three years ago, as far as we understand, it was more focused on crisis management, on peacekeeping. Currently, it's a containment of a foe, and this foe 
can easily be recognized. We certainly take it very, very seriously. And the kind of policy that has been chosen against us uh, will make us certainly to be prepared for any eventualities. If you ask me, are we doomed to that kind of relations in the future? I hope not. We need to find solutions. And step number one, if Ukraine is such a strong dividing point, is to make sure that the Minsk II agreement is fully implemented. And I underline the word fully, because we are trying to work with the Ukrainian partners of ours, trying to make them come uh, to fill their commitments on a number of issues that are important to the people of Ukraine who feel Russians. And those uh, elections that need to be organized uh, on a joint basis, it's constitutional reform that would grant special status promised by Kyiv long ago to these people. It's amnesty for the people who are fighting the government in uh, uh, Eastern Ukraine because otherwise they cannot participate in political uh, life uh, of the country. And they want to be part of political life of the country. Thank you, Ambassador. So that is the core issue for today. And uh, yesterday there was another conversation of the leaders of Normandy 4. And I was very encouraged to hear that at least one important step was approved upon that would be helping the Ukrainians and the opposition to pull back from the dividing line uh, the weapons, uh, tanks, and uh, artillery. Thank you. Ambassador Lute. Well, let me go back to the original question. Is this uh, back to the Cold War? And despite uh, Ambassador Kislev's, uh presentation, I would argue no. Uh, this is not a return to the Cold War. I said the same. You said the same, but then you followed on with uh, additional commentary. Um, <laughs> but, but I do think there's an element. There's an element of the Cold War here that is familiar, and that is that we can see a set of events transpire on the ground and have two fundamentally different views of what just happened. Uh, now, we, I don't think, should spend the next hour uh, disputing the two sides of these views. Um, I mean, <laughs> yes, but, but that's not to say I accept your views. Uh, but it, there, there are a couple elements that I do agree with on what you just said. First of all, um, that the path out of the Ukraine crisis is full implementation of the Minsk agreements. Uh, we're on a timeline to present that outcome, to, to deliver that outcome by the end of this year. It's a very ambitious time schedule, given what's laid out in the Minsk agreement. And it's going to require cooperation from all sides, uh, inside Ukraine, also international supporters uh, from the West, and, um, and also from Russia. So I agree with you on that front. I also agree with you that, uh, and I'm glad that you've noticed, that there's a marked increase in NATO presence uh, in the air, at sea, and on the ground. That's good that you've noticed that. Um, but <laughs> NATO is fundamentally not taking those steps with any, with any intent or, uh, or any provocative rationale towards Russia. Rather, NATO is taking all those steps. And the US has actually led in these assurance measures in response to what we've witnessed uh, in Ukraine, and in particular, first Crimea, and then later in the Donbass, and persistent today in the Donbass. So NATO has, in a way, gone back to basics. And the basics are the pledge of Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, which is now 66 years old. We've been amazingly consistent with what NATO is all about. And it's the collective defense of today, it's 28 members. So yes, we're taking these steps. This should not be seen as provocative to you. Uh, one company even of armored cavalry troopers in uh, Estonia cannot be seen as the spearhead of an invasion force on anyone. Rather, that one company, uh, which is persistently rotated through the Baltic states now and, and elsewhere along our eastern flank, is designed to reassure uh, all 28 members that Article 5, an attack on one is an attack on all, means exactly what it says. All right, um, let's drill down to some specifics. Can I just add one thing? Sure. I, don't, I, I agree with Doug, we shouldn't uh, dispute um, the reality of what's happening on the ground, but I do want to just 
fill in the other part of the picture because the ambassador talked about a lot of the activities that uh, we are undertaking. And part of the problem, and, and to go back to the other ambassador's point about trust, is that the Russian military has been exercising like crazy and in a way that's actually not quite comparable with how we've been exercising. So part of the problem is that our allies are quite alarmed because the Russian exercises are done with very little notice. They're called snap exercises. They, they involve up to uh, 100,000 um, troops, so they're quite larger than what we've done. Anything that we've done on our side has been telegraphed in advance, so we're very transparent. And it's only involved, to my knowledge, up to 7,000 troops. So there's a, there's a difference there. The other thing is the long-range aviation, the bombing flights, the Russian military has conducted uh, similar flights and actually a lot of flights over Asia, over the US and Europe. So I just want to fill in a little bit, although I don't want to argue back and forth no, too I much. Also want to <laughs> All right. I don't, I don't even I need to moderate. So yeah, I think your job is over. Picture, yeah, right? OK. <laughs> um, let me, let, let's, let's drill down to some, some specifics so on Ukraine. Now that we're on, you know, you'll get a chance. So, you know, um, all right, uh, Dr. Farkas, I want to ask you this. Uh, in May, Vice President Biden uh, raised the idea of sending uh, lethal aid to Ukraine. There was a story in the Wall Street Journal two days ago that uh, said that there was long-range radars being considered to be sent to Ukraine. Um, where are we in this process at, the, at this moment? And is, is arming the Ukrainians or sending lethal aid to Ukraine the sort of European equivalent of training and arming the Syrian rebels? that we can constantly hear talk about it and it never really happens? Um, so Eli, thank you for asking. Uh, okay. We are proud of the assistance that we've provided from the yes. United States to Ukraine. It's not just military assistance, mm -hmm. so we've provided significant economic assistance. Indeed. We've provided, of course, the political support. That's probably the most important thing that we mm. provide to the Ukrainian government. And then thirdly, uh, as you mentioned, we've provided military assistance. It's up to about $244 million that we've committed to date. That's over a two-year period. And um, today, we just actually announced some more training, but it's more of the same, roughly, of what we've been doing in, in eastern Ukraine, uh, sorry, in western Ukraine. We're also, as you mentioned, equipping the Ukrainians so that they can have some nominal, some territorial defense. They can ter defend their territory. They can improve their professional capabilities, their tactics, their techniques and procedures. With regard to the question of lethal versus non-lethal, I think, number one, we've been addressing priorities that the Ukrainian military has, has brought to us. So everything from literally Band-Aids and body armor and Humvees armored, unarmored. We just, 100 Humvees just arrived about 10 days ago in, or no, less than that, about a week ago in, in Ukraine. So there's a, a steady stream of equipment that's going out to the Ukrainians. But with the question of whether it's lethal or non-lethal, that's not really the issue. The issue is what is useful and what is useful within the context of supporting the diplomacy. So supporting the Minsk agreement and the, and the diplomacy that is getting us to a final agreement as, the, as Ambassador Lute mentioned. So we want to get to the point where the Ukrainians and the, and the Russians agree and all parties to the Minsk agree. And we have not only the items that uh, Ambassador Kislyak mentioned, so the, the legislation which the Ukrainian uh, Rada just adopted, which uh, provides significant autonomy to those regions, but also provides for ceasefire, which unfortunately the Russian-supported separatists and Russian forces with them have not abided by. We, it also provides for a, a, a pullback from the line of control. And of course, eventually in December, the Ukrainians should be able to control their territory again. So there's a, there's a lot of things that need to happen within the Minsk process. The US government is very supportive of that. Everything we do is tailored to that ultimate success, that so, ultimate conclusion. So was Vice President Biden ahead of his spurs a little bit in May when he mentioned a lethal aid? I think everything, look, the president has not said anything is off the table necessarily. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an ongoing process of reviewing. So the vice president, the president are very much in the mix and they're, they are very aware of the overall picture and can make a determination at any time if they wish. Okay, speaking of aid, I wanna to get to you, Ambassador Wittig. Um, it's pretty clear that Ukraine is on the brink of a, what appears to be a pretty serious financial crisis. I've heard figures, uh, I think, from the prime minister who said that the war is costing seven or eight million dollars a day. Um, your country is very prosperous and uh, has been generous with relatively, other relatively. insolvent countries in, the, in, in Europe. Um, what are your thoughts on maybe um, a more substantive bailout of Ukraine? 
Thank you. Uh, I'll come to that. Um, just with mm -hmm. all due respect to um, Ambassador Kiseliak, um, I think his narrative needs a robust uh, fact-checking. And um, I, I, I would um, not engage in that, but this was not a coup. Uh, Russians in the Crimea and in uh, East Ukraine were not harassed or persecuted. Uh, you never took this to any international body. Uh, Ru Russian armed soldiers without uh, signs were deployed in the Crimea, and so on and on and on. So just to tell you we don't share that, that narrative. Um, but on the Ukraine, um, it's important to put the focus on supporting the Ukraine. And I think sometimes this focus gets um, shifted away to questions of sanctions against Russia, which are equally important. But the main focus that we have is support the Ukraine financially, economically, in their energy independence, so that we prevent the emergence of a fragile state. That is the most important thing. Now, that entails a huge additional financial transfers by the IMF, by the US, by the EU, and by us uh, bilaterally. We are the biggest uh, European donor for the Ukraine, and you probably had Greece in mind. Um, if you tell um, uh, the taxpayers in Europe that in addition of a, a 90 billion, uh, again, a bailout of Greece, they should now engage with billions and billions of dollars or euros for Ukraine, that's a challenge. I admit that. But there's no way around. We've got to support Ukraine uh, economically and financially. But there are other things that we, uh, we, we, have, we have to do. Uh, we have to encourage reform in the Ukraine. It, our aid has to, come, has to come with benchmarks. The corruption has to be uh, vigorously um, uh, eradicated, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are other elements to resolve the Ukraine crisis, and some of them were mentioned. Uh, reassurance, um, our sanctions um, against Russia tied to the implementation of the Minsk agreement, and of course, dialogue with Russia. This is something that I want to uh, tell Ambassador Kiselyak. Um, we will certainly uh, never give up in talking to Russia about Ukraine and other elements of our relationship, and we believe that that is important to have an open channel of communication. Okay, Ambassador Kislyev, I want to. I know you're you're dying to respond, but let me oh, yes. ask you. <laughs> Last month, uh, Vladimir Putin said, "Everything we do, oh, Sorry. okay, <laughs> everything we do is a response to the threats emerging against us." So, my question for you: How is the annexation of Crimea and Spetsnaz invasion of Crimea a response to the emerging threats against Russia? Well. First of all, uh, I respectfully disagree with Peter as to the Crimea not being threatened. We can go into the files and you will find that one of the first set of statements in the Rada by the right sector, the organization of the extreme rights that brought to, to power those people, <clears throat> they first promised Maidans in Simferopol, the capital of Crimea, and Sevastopol, and they tried to do so. Two people were killed. Secondly, they promised to send a friendship train, quote unquote, friendship train filled with thugs with weapons to impress on the Crimeans the wisdom of the overthrow of the government. I'm not, I didn't use the word coup. It was overthrow because the peaceful protest against decision of the president to postpone the signature of the association agreement was peaceful. For days and days it was peaceful, normal, fully respectfully uh, done. People were chanting slogans, they were singing songs, they were uh, seeing rock concerts, supporting the cause, but they were peaceful. Till the moment when the, we saw hundreds of young, well-trained people organized in what is called sotnya in Russian and Ukrainian, and that means hundred. That's the way Cossack army in the Soviet Union, uh, in Russia, Tsarist Russia was organized, in hundreds. 
They came, they infiltrated the crowd, they became part of it, but they came, and that was the most important part of it. They came with balaclavas on their uh, faces. Those who were standing, normal people living in Kiev, protesting the decision of the president, they were peaceful. But then we saw people in balaclavas, with protection gear, with Molotov cocktails, with baseball bats, and they were attacking police that didn't have orders to shoot. I cannot imagine what would have happened here in the States if people in Balaclava would try to attack police in this country. Canada might have annexed Maine. Kidding, but... Um. Yeah, but I, I, then I would like to, uh, to, give, to give a very brief uh, answer to Ambassador Lute. Uh, you are glad that we noticed your activities, Dexter. I'm glad that you are glad, but the problem is that we respect you uh, more than to believe that you feel that anybody on the border with Russia in NATO countries is threatened. We will certainly understand that Russia isn't harboring any attack against these countries. You know it. And since you know it, and that's our view, and you deploy forces there, and what is most important, you expand infrastructure next to our border that can be used further on for massive airlift of the forces to massive attack. That's the problem. We believe that you are significantly better than you publicly admit. Well, if I may. Um, if you believe uh, in NATO in that regard, that we will do as we've always said we will do, then you must believe that Article 5 means what it says. And what we've simply been doing for the last 15 months or so is demonstrating to our easternmost allies who are new to the alliance and have not long lived under Article 5 that what we say in the Washington Treaty is exactly what we will do. Now, let me paint a bit of contrast here, okay? When we exercise in, uh, on the sovereign territory of our Eastern allies, we're invited. Others might be uninvited. When we do these uh, exercises, we are walking behind the NATO flag, behind the American flag. The US soldiers have the American flag on their right shoulder unlike other soldiers who are uninvited on other territories. When our aircraft fly in international airspace, they operate inside the rules of the international organization that governs that airspace. So they're in touch with ground controllers, they, uh, uh, they have their transponders on, uh, they're not a threat to civil aviation and accidents. When our ships operate in the Baltic Sea and in the Black Sea, they do so in accordance with international agreements. All this goes to underline that NATO here is the mature, predictable, stabilizing influence doing exactly what we advertise. Um, and uh, we're glad that you know that, but you know NATO well enough to know that that's exactly the kind of organization we are. All right, I want to ask. OK, you want to you respond, but then? <laughs> Maybe later on. You, OK. All yeah, right. OK, about the wisdom uh, reigning in NATO. You know, I've been there. I spent five and a half years at NATO. I was then when you started bombing campaign against Serbia. We had, I do not remember how many meetings of NATO Russia Council specifically devoted to this crisis. And uh, you heard us and you did what you decided to do. In my view, you made several mistakes we helped you out afterwards when you were left without uh, targets for your aviation. And you were already discussing whether you need to put people on the ground and the Serbs would have welcomed you there. We helped you out, among others, to find a peaceful solution out of this crisis. But what NATO did, they were bombing Serbia to change the boundaries of a sovereign state as a result of this bombing campaign, a war, what we see happening, Kosovo became independent because NATO has become Air Force 
of the Kosovo forces fighting Serbia. That's if I, if I could. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I apologize. All right. Uh, we are talking about our trust in NATO. We certainly understand it. You understand us. You understand everything. But you have your own logic of action. That's our view. Libya. We gave you the mandate for the campaign with the sole purpose of protecting civilian lives. You overstepped the mandate, and you knew that you overstepped, and we were telling you this. You disregarded it. Look at what was left of Libya afterwards. So when it comes to the wisdom and uh, stability factor for NATO, uh, we have somewhat different view. If, if I may, if I want to just press you on that, I mean, I, and I'll, I had other questions, but. You've just given um, an indirect, I suppose, justification for your, your country's actions in Crimea by talking about what you saw as a violent coup in, uh, in Kyiv. I didn't use the word coup. Overthrow right. of the government. A violent overthrow of the government. Yeah. Um, when NATO intervened in Kosovo, it was to stop the ethnic cleansing of Albanians there. So I don't understand how you have this double standard in terms of interventions. Can you explain that? First of all, I didn't make any uh, parallels, you did. Okay. Secondly, uh, the decision by the Crimeans to go independent is something that they decided. We embraced them immediately. And 85% of people in Russia fully support that kind of decision because those are people who historically belong to Russia and they were under threat. Okay. All right, I have a question now for you, Ambassador Luke. Um, last year, when Obama was in Estonia, he said that NATO's commitment to that country was, I quote, unbreakable, unwavering, and eternal. Does this mean that in 2034, President Chelsea Clinton would go to war <laughs> on behalf of the Estonians? I mean, can we spell that out a little bit? It seems that Obama has committed us to the territorial defense of these Baltic states um, you know. Well, President Obama didn't commit us to that. Uh, I mean, NATO, you're saying, did. Yeah, yeah President okay. Obama did not commit the United States as one of the 28 members of NATO just last year. I mean, that happened when Estonia and the other Baltic right. states became members of the alliance. So what he was simply reiterating in, uh, I think, uh, one of his strongest speeches, by the way, uh, was that we will with the entry of those countries into NATO, defend them just as we would defend one of the 12 original allies. Okay. So he also said there are not new allies and old allies. There are not uh, large ally allies and small allies. There's just 28 allies. So he was, in a very fundamental way, just reviewing the, um, the Article 5 commitment that is as strong today as it was when it was first inaugurated in 1949. Ambassador Wittig, do you, do you agree that that commitment is unbreakable, unwavering, and eternal? Well, this is a commitment, the Article 5 commitment, that we all engaged in. <clears throat> and it should be credible. And, and, and that, is, you know, that is so vital for those countries who feel vulnerable, the Baltic states, Poland, other uh, NATO members at the Eastern Rim. And, and this is why we also deploy forces there. So to show that we have a great skin in the game there. Uh, Article 5 is viable and is credible, and it obliges us to act in case uh, one of our NATO allies is attacked, and, and we stand by that. Would Germany send troops in such a situation? Well, you know, I, I cannot, um, uh, we, we have troops there, and I cannot specula speculate about a situation that I don't know, but I, um, and I cannot gauge the reaction that NATO then would take uh, and it would be wrong to anticipate uh, that, but I can you know, vigorously reaffirm, reaffirm that Article 5 is valid for us also in, in, in this present situation. Okay. I wonder against him. Against whom? Hmm? Against whom? You against mean, anybody who, who engages It's only in Finland that is left there. <laughs> All right, um, I want to talk about a concept that has emerged, especially in NATO, of the hybrid threat from uh, Russia. So I'm just going to open it up at first and say, what is the hybrid threat as you would understand it? And any, any, any one of you, including you, Ambassador, like, what, what is your hybrid threat? And uh, how does Russia have well, a hybrid threat against the Europe? The hybrid threat to Russia is color revolutions. 
economic and military pressure. Attack uh, designs to change regimes. That is kind of uh, situation that we had seen developing. How would you define the hybrid threat? Well, hybrid threat is when the lines between uh, peaceful action and military actions are blurred, intentionally blurred, in order to be under the radar screen of international law. Um, and, and that, some countries in Europe say, is happening, um, especially the, in, in in the Baltic states, uh, some citizens say um, uh, there is a, a hybrid threat here. Um, and it has various tools, uh, you know, uh, information tools, media tools, economic tools, energy tools, and sending fighters um, under anonym with anonymous uh, uniforms there. Um, we, are, we are not threatened by, by hybrid warfare, but it is an issue that has emerging, has been emerging. NATO, I think, is dealing with that issue. Um, we are not very good at it, uh, quite frankly, so far, because this is not in our toolbox. We, we, we don't engage in hybrid warfare. So we have to readjust um, our response to that kind of hybrid warfare threat. And one key element of it is a good communication not resorting to the Cold War communication, but um, communicating in an enlightened Western style way. Um, uh, and, and that is a challenge uh, for us. Dr. Farr. And I would only add to what the ambassador said. It's a, it's a combination between conventional military means and asymmetric means. And you can see it actually very vividly in eastern Ukraine, where you have conventional forces, but you also have these, these un unconventional hybrid means, um, strategic communications. You have um, IEDs, so you have uh, explosives going off to terrorize the population or to um, affect the will of the, of the Ukrainians. So it, it is this mixed and this very, um, un, this very blurry, this blurring between conventional and asymmetric that occurs. All right, I want to let's drill down a little bit more specifically, and I want to give you, Ambassador, because I have a, an opportunity here to respond. But it does seem that your, the Kremlin has taken a keen interest in nurturing some of the far right and far left parties in Europe. So my first question is, why do you why do you love uh, Marine Le Pen so much? Well, we uh, talked to many members of European Parliament who represent the choice of European uh, people. Today and yesterday, we had uh, 10 French, I think, senators in Crimea. And we welcome them. They are all kind of parties represented because they decided that enough is enough of the propaganda about the situation there. They wanted to assess themselves. I haven't heard what the uh, views are going to be, but it's very important that anybody who wants to listen and to understand does it. Because the level of uh, distortion, absence of truthful reporting about what we are, what we are not here in the States, and to lesser degree, but also pre uh, present in Europe, is phenomenal. Phenomenal. And the things that were happening in Kyiv, things were happening in Crimea, have never been fully reported. And uh, that's why I think there is kind of one-sided view as to what was happening. You are playing with uh, emotions of people that we are talking to Le Pen and the left. We are talking to everybody who is available to work to make stability in Europe. And members of parliaments of European countries, irrespective of what are the uh, parties they represent, are certainly very important interlocutors to us. Ambassador Riddick, do you, do you, do you think Russia's um, support and nurturing of Syriza and other kinds of what might be called fringe parties in Europe has been leading to the stability of uh, the continent? I, I'm not part of the intelligence community, so I don't know um, which party 
they are supporting financially. Um, that is not really our issue, but um, I would say um, there are countries that are vulnerable in the European Union and um, that might be prone to um, uh, Russian overtures and that we see with a certain um, apprehension. Dr. Can I can, can I can I make one, one additional yes, point course. because we've we've been discussing a little bit um, the, those issues that divide us uh, so much, like the genesis of the Ukraine uh, conflict. I want to highlight one or two issues that maybe also looking forward unite us. The first one is has been mentioned our implementation of the Minsk uh, agreement, uh, which we all all want to stick to, we have differences on how um, much we succeeded and who um, is responsible for not implementing it, but we all stick to the Minsk agreement and that's still a good sign. And I want to highlight also, if I may, um, challenges that unite us um, in wanting to respond collectively. And I want to remark here one, where we did uh, respond collectively, and that was the Iran nuclear issue. Russia, to our view, was a very mm, quite responsible member of the negotiations, and, and I think that has to be highlighted because there are certain global challenges we want to meet and, and face together with Russia. Syria might be another one, and there are many more. So it fits into my uh, sort of forward-looking um, hypothesis that we need to find uh, a new cooperative security agenda with Russia. So let me just add to uh, the ambassador's list. I mean, not only would the Iran agreement been impossible without Russia's cooperation, the elimination of Assad's chemical weapons would have been impossible without Russian cooperation. Partial uh, elimination. We or the main... As it is, okay. the, the level of elimination uh, would have not been possible without uh, Russian cooperation. We have a robust counterterrorism um, uh, portfolio that keeps us in close contact with Russian authorities. I mean, American astronauts don't get to the space station these days right. without uh, Russian cooperation. So there's a whole series of things, uh, somewhat compartmented areas, where we still have common interests and, it, and I think to take the ambassador's point, these are areas in which we should continue to invest and work alongside Russia. So I'll add to that list. Um, what I wanted okay. to do was, because picking up on what the ambassador said about get, getting into Crimea, seeing what's going on in Crimea, one of the successes, actually, collective successes, is the OSCE response. And Russia's a member of OSCE. And OSCE has been very helpful in the MINTS process and also through the, the, the monitors that go through. So I think if we can get more OSCE monitors into Crimea, in addition to parliamentarians, that would be very helpful. Um, but I also agree, and I want to end on a positive note, we do cooperate with Russia. We do want to cooperate more with Russia. I think we just need to see a resolution of the, of the crisis in Ukraine in a way that ev all parties can agree is fair and in keeping with international law, and then we can move on to a bigger agenda, but in the meantime, of course, we'll continue to cooperate where possible and where it's in our national security interest. I would like also to contribute to this positive note because uh, it's almost the way I see the situation, with some caveats, of course, uh, Russian caveats. Uh, one of them is that there are so many things that unite us subjectively. The challenges of today, the ones you've been discussing a day and a half, ISIL, terrorism, uh, safety of the communications uh, are the same with us. ISIL being one of the most important and immediate threat for Russia because we live next by, unlike the United States hidden by an ocean. And uh, ISIL in Iraq is spillover from Syria. Further spillover in Afghanistan might lead to spillover to Central Asia. And we do not have uh, protected borders with Central Asia. And it was conscious decision of ours not to build ones. And that is an issue of utmost importance uh, on which we haven't been uh, able to work together because the President of the United States chose to put us, if you remember, on the same level of threats to the United States 
as Ebola and ISIL. Oh, okay. On that note, on the, on the positive <laughs> note, <laughs> Ambassador Gizzo, um, maybe just, I mean, there's a little bit on the Iran question. Um, can you kind of fill us in in your understanding of, or maybe what you're planning to sell the Iranians in terms of conventional and ballistic missiles now that uh, you've helped forge this wonderful conventional deal? Conventional and ballistic. What's the difference? Conventional and ballistic Conventional missiles. weapons and ballistic missiles. I, like I, mean. you know? I don't know. Okay. I know only one thing. Yeah. that at the international uh, standards, MTCR, that's the organization that is uh, controlling the spread, against the spread of ballistic missiles. We are part of it. We help to develop it. And we are certainly going to comply to the letter. We are members of the Non-Proliferation uh, Treaty, uh, like the United States. And we are depositories of this treaty. And we have been working with the United States on this issue, even in the Cold War. And we are continuing to do so today, as if nothing happened. I think there are several uh, areas of cooperation that have been uh, insulated from the difficulties of time. You are, were absolutely right that out, out of space where Russian and American cosmonauts and astronauts are risking their lives together. They are relying on each other to complete the missions that they were giving. It's a phenomenal uh, program as far as I'm concerned, and I would say kind of idealistic model for the rest of relations between Russia and the United States. And uh, so whatever we decide to sell to a country that is under no international sanctions, if and when it happens, will be decided uh, I mean, on, I, on a commercial basis. We want to go to questions soon, but do you have an interpretation of when that would happen, when those, those restrictions would be lifted? Well, it's a process uh, that is going to be discussed uh, in the Security Council. The Security Council resolution first, adopting right. and memorizing. Uh, the uh, agreement has been already approved, so there is a process. What is more important for us to watch what is happening in the United States, and we need certainly to be sure that the uh, agreement that we all negotiated for almost 11 year, uh, years together with our German friends and uh, uh, the rest of the P5 plus one, uh, that it's something that was negotiated in good faith. It was long and difficult negotiations. It's a, an agreement that certainly consist of compromises, but it helps to remove a uncertainty about any uh, possibility for Iran to go nuclear in terms of going nuclear, for nuclear weapons. That's important because that removes one of the biggest uncertainty in the region. And once again, unlike America, we live next by. Iran is our neighbor, we want it to be a normal uh, neighbor for us and for the rest of the region. And we do not want it to be nuclear. We do not want any calamities uh, in the countries next to our country. All right, let's open it up to questions. All right, right over there. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. This is a very interesting and important panel. Uh, my name is Steve Shapiro. In 2010, I had the privilege at the end of the year to travel to the Baltics on behalf of um, the Supreme Allied Commander, uh, Ambas uh, Secretary Farkas, was on that trip, and she may know what I'm going to say. Um, at that time, the Baltics gave us a uniform uh, uh, commentary with respect to their relationship to Russia. They felt that they were under attack, low-level, non-kinetic attack, 24-7, uh, on all aspects of civil society, economic aspects, Cyber, of course, energy was a huge pressure, political party pressure, demographic pressure, newspaper pressure, real estate pressure, I can go on. And um, I had the opportunity to ask the Estonian Under Secretary of Defense uh, a question, and that was whether he was qu confident that NATO's Article 5 commitment to the Baltics was in fact, quote, rock solid, as Brussels wanted us to tell them. And uh, he replied, quote, sure, I am, but the question is, is Putin? So now I finally have the opportunity to ask that question. Mr. Ambassador, can you tell us what, in fact, Mr. Putin's impression of Article 5 is? I wouldn't even discuss Article 5 in this context. 
because everything that he brought as a kind of concerns of uh, our Baltic friends is certainly uh, not serious, especially real estate pressure. There are wealthy Russians who love the resorts there. And when they come and invest money, they are loved there by the locals. It's everywhere the same. Communications, they leave uh, watching Russian TV and news like we do. If they do not like it, switch it off. Uh, they under energy pressure. They are under energy pressure. I would like to see the numbers because they get uh, as much as they can. And we were willing to provide them even more. They destroyed in Baltics, in Galina, power stations under the pressure of our European friends. They certainly experienced problems. We could have helped them to build a new one. Uh, so I'm not even willing to discuss concerns in the context of Article 5. It's not questions to me. Okay. Ask them, Over somebody here. else. Alexander Rossolimo, Center for Security and Social Progress. For over 20 years, the United States had provided around $400 million annually through the non luga program to help Russia secure its nuclear materials and dismantle certain weapon and delivery systems. Within the last year and a half, the Russian Federation has left, has left as this agreement expire. So my question is, why did Russia withdraw from non luger um, What are the consequences to nuclear security? And what is the likelihood that Russia might rejoin this agreement, this program in the future? Well, first of all, as far as I remember, non luger uh, it's kind of a umbrella program under which there were a number of agreements. Some of them were extremely important to us. I would name one. When the uh, Soviet Union ceased to exist, we faced a huge problem of repatriating all, all strategic nuclear weapons of the Soviet Union to the Russian territory. It was a massive operation. Nobody in the world had undertaken anything of the kind that required specialized equipment, specialized rail cars, a lot of other stuff, and we had to do it in a way that would protect the cargo from any uh, eventualities. I remember I was working on this program on Russian side with our American colleagues. At that time, this help with cars, with Kevlar equipment, with everything, was absolutely indispensable for us to be able to do it in a safe and reliable fashion. We appreciated that. Another program that I would mention among the most helpful to us was helping to build a facility to destroy chemical weapons. The United States took upon themselves almost the cost of one facility out of the six that we had to build in a very fast fashion because American friends of ours convinced us to sign up to the Convention to Prohibit Chemical Weapons that had very limited time allowed for destruction of chemical weapons, 10 years. United States failed to dis uh, destroy their own stocks. We also failed. <laughs> so we are working together now on this issue. And that's one of <coughs> also very, very uh, important contribution that the United States has done. There are a number of other programs that were important, um, but we have uh, developed our own, own economy. It's not bad. We are seventh in the world, and we can easily, not easily, but we can continue to deal with our issues ourselves. That's one issue. Secondly, the agreement that was signed in 91 to allow that kind of cooperation was signed in under such circumstances that under international uh, law on international agreements of Russia, nobody would have approved of it today. 
And the reason is that the way it was written, among other things, theoretically, allowed any American coming to us under this program to blow up a power station to leave without any penalty. I'm bringing you, of course, an extreme, uh, extreme uh, explanation. There were many more. So with all gratitude and respect, we decided that we complete the programs that were ongoing, and we are not going to sign new agreements unless it is on a different legal basis. And uh, as first, secondly, I uh, do not believe that uh, currently that kind of emergent uh, assistance that we received in the Nadis is as relevant today. If I could just add one quick thing, Eli. First of all, the Department of Defense stands ready to work on these programs to restart work at any moment because we do believe it's a very important program. But you do not talk to Russian military. Well, okay. <laughs> Uh, no, it's not non okay. Non-proliferation <laughs> and arms control is carved out of the frozen military-to-military -military and defense dialogue. Um, but the other thing is that the one tragic thing is the ambassador mentioned the, the strategic arms and the agreement that various states made to ship their arms to Russia for safekeeping. Well, one of those countries was Ukraine. So I just want to mention the, the additional tragedy of the, that was the Budapest Memorandum in 1994 and was, was to allow those, those strategic weapons to go back to Ukraine, and in exchange, all the signatory countries, the United States, United Kingdom, and Russia, agreed to, uh, to abide by or to respect and protect Ukraine's territorial sovereignty. Protect? Well, The United respect. States is willing to protect? Anyway, I... It I, wasn't in the agreement. You okay. need to be factually correct. This protocol didn't provide for situation of a overthrow of legitimate government and okay. the overall uh, civil war in the country. Well, and it also was a political agreement. You're right, Mr. Ambassador. It wasn't a rock solid alliance or anything like that. But I wanted to point out merely that there, this was an additional tragedy that has gone unmentioned, the fact that the Budapest Memorandum has caused problems in the non-proliferation arena. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Well, we I, think we, yeah, I think that that's our time is up. And on, I want to thank our, our panelists. Thank you. Our panel on the Cold War ended on a, on a little bit of a chilly note, I think. <laughs>